Bien, vamos a dejar de compartir. Muy buenas tardes con todos. Bienvenidos. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We welcome you to this webinar. I'm Sandra Reyes of the staff of LACNIC. So I want to thank you for connecting to this webinar. In preparation to LACNIC 40, LACNAC 2023 in Fortaleza, Brazil, this webinar will discuss the setup of a Linux servers with IPv6 only. Our uh, we have the NICBR people who we are going to introduce later on, and also part of the staff of LACNIC that will be with us. Alejandro Costa, who's the coordinator, the r &T coordinator, Carlos Martinez, the technology manager. So before that, let me explain the dynamics of the webinar. La sesión. Vamos a contar con interpretación simultánea en tres idiomas, español, inglés We are going to have simultaneous interpretation of Spanish, Portuguese, and English. You'll be able to access this service in the Zoom platform. This session is going to last about an hour. It's uh, We're going to have some room for questions. So we suggest that you could write questions respuesta. that you may have in the future. So you can touch uh, the... Uh, toolbar at the bottom of the page. Let me tell you that this webinar will be recorded and later we are going to share the video so that you can see this session later. So uh, we are going to give the floor to Carlos Martinez, who's going to welcome you. Carlos. Thank you, Sandra. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you uh, to this webinar of IPv only Linux service. Um, we are going to be with uh, Tiago Schul and Lucas Jorge of uh, Nick Brazil and Alejandro Costa, who are of our R&D experts at Black Nick. And I wanted to show you this these topics because we consider that after all we've talked of, about IPv6 this year's, I think that we should give a step forward and somehow start little by little uh, uh, getting rid of IPv4. We are never going to be able to get rid of everything because the big challenge precisely is how to make the best use possible of the very scarce pool of IPv4 addresses still available in the market in general and in the parallel markets that we might not uh, enjoy so much. So this webinar is a part of a cycle of knowledge generation that starts today and will end in LACNIC 40 in Fortaleza in October. We are going to have three different uh, cases. Two of them are going to be online. This is the first and the third one will somehow be the culmination of everything that will be as we meet in person in October in Fortaleza. So the idea is to break down how to create networks with IPv6 only and the elements that we consider that we need to cover. One of them is how to set up configure servers, how to use proxies and how to use other transition tools, trying to understand uh, all together the challenges that it means to operate with two networks in parallel if you have uh, wanted to have private uh, ipv4 and networks in parallel with ipv6 and if we finally get to fortaleza where we might have the possibility to test things together in a lab so that's all i wanted to tell you i hope that we can have you all in Fortaleza and that we can add more people in the next uh, cases. And I'm sure that you will take home a lot from uh, the, these presentations. So now Alejandro is uh, going to start. I leave you with him. Hello, Carlos. Hello, everybody. Well, first of all, let me thank all uh, the participants. I'm Alejandro Costa. I work in the R&D area for LACNIC. Carlos uh, and 
This uh, Hannes is the uh, CDO of LACNIC, and I'm going to introduce the next two speakers, and then Tiago Jung, Nakamura, IT engineer of the Polytechnic uh, University of Sao Paulo, and he uh, in, works in NICVR, and he works on training of uh, computer networks and internet as IPv6 and best current internet. Uh, practices for autonomous systems. And then Lucas Jorge, who has a degree on electric engineering, especially in computer networks, conducting uh, um, network planning uh, equipment uh, uh, configuration and technical support. He also works with for uh, Nick VR as project analyst. So uh, let me go on. Let me start by telling you about um, IPv6 addressing plans, which I consider to be a great advantage because usually when you listen to the, you, when you hear about the IPv6 world, you are pointed out a number of advantages, but very technical, for instance, um, that there's no fragmentation in the routers when you transmit uh, an IPv6 packet that the IP, the number of IP addresses is much longer because much greater because you have 128. So the plan of a IPv6 addressing, personally, I see it as an additional advantage, and I think that very little is said compared to the benefits that this will bring to a network. That is why I'm going to try to convince you that uh, the IPv6 addressing plan is truly an advantage in the world of uh, addressing plans. So this is what we are going to discuss, sort of compressed, but um, I hope uh, that you understand everything. So let me start with uh, explaining what an IP addressing plan is. And if you look at the concept in Google or in other searchers, uh, uh, you, you, you have a uh, browser, it's hard to find it. But we can say that uh, an IP addressing plan is the mode, the actions, the systematic model to implement uh, the assignments of uh, the uh, IPv6 uh, I IP addresses. If I am going to install a new um, um, device, I have a, a printer or whatever, I'm going to put that inside of a framework, and that's what we call the addressing uh, plan. Of course, now we're going to discuss the world of IPv6. Why would we do this? There are many reasons. Here, I mentioned just a few. One of them, undoubtedly, is the efficiency of the network. For the ISPs, either medium-sized or larger, uh, we are going to have smaller uh, routing tables. If I don't have an addressing uh, plan, my routers are going to have a huge uh, tables that are going to be processed in an inefficient manner. We are going to uh, use up um, more CPU memory. And, uh, and uh, we also want to keep a certain order. In the 10 minutes that I'm going to talk to you, we are going to talk about that order. And uh, the uh, um, allocation policies are maybe more easier to implement. You may have a, a campus, a university. How are we going to implement that? Well, I'd like to have a policy to uh, so that everything will be in order and at the end, everything will cause less headaches and to maintain, keep documentation of what I'm doing. If I'm assigning IPV um, uh, addresses to my clients, to the schools of the university, and I wanted to have a documentation uh, I want to say that uh, this is uh, in a certain way. Then we'll have a troubleshooting. If tomorrow I have a plan put together and it's well documented and uh, you have an IP address or you have a virus that's sending spam or uh, it's being attacked uh, um, because the computer has been attacked, I'll be able to quickly implement that that comes from the School of Law of the campus of uh, Rio de Janeiro and the university, and I can address that problem. If I have a plan, then I have a, when I have more schools, more clients, uh, then I'm going to be able to do it more easily. That will support the growth of the network. And 
Uh, these are, I mean, the management, monitoring the network, and eventually that it will be more comfortable for everyone. And basically, we are going to save many headaches. It's going to spare us many headaches. What do we aim at when we plan, mark a plan, is that it could be scaled up, but best practices, flexible and simple. So this, um, so here I'm giving you an example. I'm deploying, I'm implementing IPv6. How am I going to do my addressing plan to meet these four characteristics? So let's try and compare what came from IPv4 and how it is today in IPv6. If we, in IPv4, I had 32 bits separated by 8-bit fields, four uh, fields, and more or less I can do something. But there's we don't have much of a margin. If you don't remember how this worked, typically you received a network, a slash 23, for instance, and you have to play with the bits that were not of softnet uh, ID and to try to play with uh, those. How many uh, bits can you play with? With one, two, three bits, uh, it's very little, but that has changed. And today in IPv6, we're talking of 128 bits. Each of us receives at least a slash 32, 96 bits to play, or we receive a slash 48. So it's very, what I can do now is very flexible. So I like to remember that uh, by default, uh, according to the NECBR policies, each receives a slash 32, all the ISPs. That is, if we have a slash 64, that basically is the most common prefix in the IPv6 world, each ISP receives at least the size of the current internet, or even more. But I don't want to uh, give you digits because I won't have time, but it's crazy. Any ISP, a wireless ISP in a small town in Brazil, for instance. So when, um, what is it that I don't want to forget? This part here, this it's mapping, um, uh, a nibble uh, that is uh, four bits a character. If we map a nibble to of a, a function, our addressing plan will make life easier, easier, much easier. Here you have an example. For instance, a nibble can represent a country, it can represent a service, an ISP. But I may have. For instance, it may be present in Colombia, in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Chile, in Mexico, a nibble. It may have 16 different positions representing the countries. I can have an, a service in the ISP. The ISP can give uh, FGV, uh, internet, uh, equipment, doxy services, DSL, satellite services, and uh, uh, studies in the university. I can say, for instance, that one character is in charge of the law school network or medicine or, or medical school or engineering or anthropology and so on. So it's very good. Here you have another example, a type of client, a department in the company and so on. So here we see a very uh, nice example. Here I have an IPv6 address. The net ID part cannot be touched because this is what I'm given by NECBR. And with the other nibbles, with the, I can play. I can say that uh, uh, these in yellow correspond to the country. And uh, here, this depends on uh, the department of the province. Here I have uh, another one, co-location, uh, BPS, and so on. If you have take this into account, when as you build, your IPv6 addressing plan, it's, you're going to have very good results. I want you to remember this. These are the advantages that I can mention today. If you are an ISP and this is uh, 
This is a router as any others that you may have. In this case, it has six interfaces. This is a gig, one giga, two gig, another giga. The, here you have a POS, uh, 10 gigas. That's not so important. But now if you have to put a mask in IPv4 world, uh, you can wonder what mask should I use, uh, slash 28, slash 25, slash 96. So if I here have 10 hosts and I put a slash 28, and tomorrow they are no longer 10 hosts, but they have more IPs, I'm going to put a secondary IPv4. Uh, uh, I, I have to do things that are very cumbersome, renumbering. So placing a mask may be complicated. It seems so easy. But you as uh, an administrator, you want things to be simple and yet that you can scale up. This is wonderful. In the IPv6 world, everything, all the interfaces are going to have a slash 64. I don't care if there's one host, five hosts, a thousand, eight thousand hosts. Here, I'm going to put a slash 64. And with that, I'll cover all my needs. I don't doubt that other things will have to be done in the future, just the same as IP before, but with a slash 64, I'm doing things I'm very well. Here I have another interesting example that I'd like you to consider is a case that is similar to the previous one. I have a router, but in this case, I have a client behind, which I'm going to connect to my network. I'm an ISP, I get a customer, a factory, a bakery, a bread factory. I manage the network. I'm the host. So what network should I supply this uh, uh, slash uh, 29 uh, uh, private uh, IPv4, private IPv6, uh, public IPv6? I may r route with a uh, uh, um, slash 30, but after six months, they're going to have more needs. I'll have to route uh, another uh, network and I have to do a prestigious work here. And at the end, I'm going here, I'm going to have all tangled because there are going to be many networks here and life gets complicated. What do I do in the IPv6 world? We were always going to assign a slash 48 to the end client, to the end user. And with that, I'm, I will have no more problems. So with that slash 48, I hope they won't call me in 10 years time. But isn't this beautiful? And I have one, only one static route to the client, quite comfortable a bit more. These are things that you can do in the world of IPv6. And uh, as I can use letters in the case of Facebook, I have Facebook, Dad, I can write something. And then, for instance, 2001, DB8 food, uh, uh, bad uh, feed, uh, bad, uh, bad feed food, bad food. Uh, I have from A to F and I can do fun things, right? These are very good things that can make it very comfortable in IPv6. Uh, in IPv4, you can do similar things, but in IPv4, it's much better. If I have a network, you have a, a VLAN 50 and I can embed this and I'm in Chile. Putting 56 is very simple. And if I have Chile and VLAN 50, as uh, the address is so long, I can put in the IPv6 address, I can put 2001, DB8, 56, 50, etc. And here, there's one that I don't like to mention because it comes from the web service world. And I can put 80 here, uh, 53 here in the DNS service network, in SSH service network, I can put 22 inside. So I think that this is like giving cookies to the hacker and say, come on, eat this biscuit. And finally, this last slide, this picture, well, you, you can do it, but I'd like you to remember what this uh, image represents. All the IPv6 uh, addressing plan, all this box here, I have the prefixes that I received. And within the prefix, I divide at least this slash 32 is divided into two slash 36s. And um, uh, here I divided them and I could have divided it here. Um, I divided this into two slash uh, uh, 64, 44s, but here 
Uh, I don't know whether you can see it. I uh, here we have internal networks in the other slash 48. I have residential uh, ADSL and here I have land uh, landlines here. I have mobile telephones, survey, uh, servers, co-location, cloud, IPTV, network, internet, and uh, etc. So this with the nibble mapping, if you understood what I said, you're going to do a, an excellent addressing plan that will support you as you grow. And as Sandra said, the questions would be left at the end. I'll, and now I'll give the floor to Tiago, please. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak uh, Portuguese. If you require, we have a simultaneous interpretation in Zoom. I work in NECBR in the training part, and uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of uh, IPv6 and everything uh, in that we have here. And IP is the core point in uh, the internet. Everything in the internet works thanks to an IP address. So if we start to think through where we can uh, contact the internet through a physical means, so we can do it through a Wi-Fi network, a fiber optic, uh, or an Ethernet cable. And what can we do in the internet? Well, we can do an endless number of things. We can access our email, a website, a service that I may have in a server, an app. I can use uh, my mobile phone services. Now, there's something that we cannot do unless we have an IP address. If we don't have the IP address, we don't have the internet. So the IP is what makes the internet work. So there won't be internet if you don't have an IP address. And what's the problem then? The problem is that for many years, we have associated this IP with IPv4. So when we talked of the internet and IP, automatically we were assuming that we talked about IPv4. Now this, so as time went by, uh, the uh, um, OS uh, uh, developers would associate IP and IPv4, and today we still see the consequences of this in some systems. When we work with IPv4, we enter the configuration of IP, but it's not that, it's an IPv4. And what does this lead us to? So, well, at the beginning of this uh, transition between IPv4 to IPv6, there, there used to be many systems that didn't work well with IPv6. Why did that happen? We, uh, because uh, IPv4, uh, we expected IPv4 to, be, to operate in the past, that could be acceptable. And even today, 25 years after the IPv6 was developed, we still see some websites that recommend to disable IPv6 to improve performance or to have better access to the network. And some uh, recommend IPv6 should uh, be disabled to improve the performance. In the past, there were many IPv6 implementations that were not correct, that had been done wrong and that caused harm. There were automatic tunnels that uh, made it uh, very slow. There were apps that did not support IPv6. It could be either because in uh, the programming there was a field that only operated with IPv4, or also because in the app there was IPv4 hard code, or in uh, the request of the DNS, uh, you could not generate uh, that search in the DNS. So there was, there were a number of uh, challenges that led to a very complicated experience. So um, that is no longer what happens today. As a matter of fact, the new providers that want to become an autonomous system will receive only one IPv6. IPv4 must remain there waiting to uh, recover a block. So the fact of working with IPv6 only is a reality. We have to accept it. We need um, to accept that there will be systems that will work with IPv6 only. So I think that that reality 
that we imagine that maybe someday we'll no longer use IPv4. There might be networks no longer using IPv4 that may become a reality because increasingly we will see apps and services that will be available only with IPv6. Not because it's much better, but because of the mere fact that there will be no more IPv4 for those people to use them in the systems. So increasingly, we'll see these cases of people and uh, 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 service providers that will be only be able to offer IPv6. That is why we created this lab and we'll discuss the transition techniques in the same webinar and we'll have a, a tutorial in LACNIC of Fortaleza. So today we recorded a video explaining step by step how you can work with the IPv6 configurations in different Linux systems. Linux systems have uh, uh, libraries of different IPs that we worked with the, the best ones, and we're going to show you how we can work with each configuration to have a, an IPv6 only computer. So now, please, if you can, sh we'll share the video and then we'll have the questions. So I'm sharing now. Video. Olá pessoal, tudo bem? Aqui é o Lucas Jorge e hoje eu vou estar com vocês mostrando como realizar a configuração de endereço. Lucas Jorge, today I'll show you how to work with a configuration of IPv6 addresses with Linux servers. We are going to use a simulator that's called a BMG where we have a typology with access to the internet and connected with three servers, each of which has a different Linux configuration. Why did we do it like this? We have uh, uh, these uh, Deblin, Ubuntu and Red Hat that are three of the most commonly used today. So um, having uh, the chances of having one of the three is quite likely. So we learn how if we learn how to configure in one of these three, we'll be able to do config network configurations with any Linux. Um, here we have the IPv6 network. 2001 ff 0 b 113 64 and these servers are in this uh, network. Each of them has a fixed uh, IPv6 address. Um, one, uh, there you have 10 for Debian, 20 for Ubuntu, and 30 for Red Hat, and they're all connected to the internet. Uh, so now we are going to divide this tutorial into three parts. And uh, so let's go in order. So let us start with the configuration of the Debian, a Debian server. Let's so now log with the root server. But before the configurations, we'll check the basis of representation of this server using the IP command. Let's see. We have two interfaces. The first one is lookback and the second one is NS3. Logback is a virtual interface that all operating system will have an ENS3. It is our connection interface to the internet. It is very important that you are able to identify the different network interfaces in our server, because once you start configuring on Linux, you hide to indicate in which network interface you are going to have your IP address. We only have one ENS3 interface, but we also have an outnet, which is an alternative name it is like an alias for that interface which is ENP03 and that's the name that we need to use on Debian to configure the different IP addresses if we set up an uh, IP address on Debian recently which is the one that we are using now Debian 12 or even a, a previous version you might be able to see the different options to configure interfaces. Here we have what we'll find within the folder slash network. And let's check that file using the cat command, cat slash etc slash network interfaces. Here we have the look back network interface. And we also have an ENP0S3. 
Debian automatically configured it. However, it is configured to work with IPv4 only. And it indicates that it is waiting for a version 4 IP THCP. And that is saying that we are waiting for that server for the network to provide that IP address to be used. As we are going to use IPv6 and not THCP, but a rather a fixed IP, we need to change the configuration that we are uh, there by default. And therefore, we need to edit that file. So we're going to use a beam, the editor on our terminal. And if you want to use another text editor like Nano, for example, you can do so as well. That is up to you. We're using this editor to uh, edit the file. But I will show you what we are going to modify. First of all, I'm going to change the first parameter. It's order. And I'm going to add sex to inet, inet sex, that's what the operating system will use for the IPv6 address. And we're going to change it from THCP to be able to inform that we're going to provide a fixed IP. When using the standard address, we're going to indicate the IP address that we're going to use 2001-12-FF-0-B113 and C-I-F-E at the end and prefix slash uh, 64. We're also going to indicate the gateway, and that is the IP output IP address that we're going to use. That is our router IP. It's 2001 12FF 0B113. One. Once these configurations are finished, we need to save the file with the command WQ. So here we have the configuration for the IP address and the gateway as well. However, we have not indicated what the DNS server is for this uh, configuration file. That happens because on Debian, to configure a DNS server, we need to use another file, it's resolve.com, and we are going to find that in the etc directory. Let's look at that file. To do so, we're going to use the cat etc resolve.conf for this, and we will see the name server option and an IP that's been automatically generated by the server. We need to modify that IP to or resolve that domain. Since this is a text file, once again, we're going to use the Veeam command to open the text editor and be able to modify the data on that file. In this tutorial, I choose to use an IPv6 a Google address. And of course, this is not a mandatory step. You can use the DNS server that you want. If you already have one within your network, you can do so, or even a different DNS server. This tutorial, we are using Google 2001 4860 4860 colon colon 8888. And I, after making these modifications, I'm going to save the file. Once the IP gateway and DNS configuration is completed, we need to ask Debian to apply such configurations. And to do so, we are going to use the system CTL restart network command. So we're going to restart the Debian service for these configurations. F, it gives us back an error message when executed the command and it doesn't work, we're going to troubleshoot to make sure that there are any other Debian services that might be causing this error message and we need to restart this network service. Here we have no errors and that shows that the modifications went through successfully. Now let's use the command IP IDD one second just to make sure that the IPVC address has been correctly and successfully applied with the prefix and that everything's working well. We're going to use the ping command to check connectivity of our server with the NICBR website. Here you can see that it's worked successfully. We're going to run another test, a connectivity test with Google. As you can see, we're testing connectivity as we have the ping command running and others are DNS servers tests. We are inquiring the DNS server and we are getting the right IP uh, for the servers. If you want to check the DNS configurations, you can use the NS lookup command and check whether you're going to see the correct domains and if we are using the DNS server that's been indicated. In this case, the Google server is configured and we are going to now look up at nick.br and also google.com to check whether this is working 
correctly and if it's been successful. We've set it up, we set up the IP address and the servers is up and running to provide us ac with access to the internet. We can also check the gateway to see if the gateway is working successfully and we can use the ip sex route command that will show us uh, the routing address that you can see highlighted on screen to check that our gateway is being configured and that our server is using its IP to access the internet. We can also modify the configurations using the network interfaces. And to do so, we're just going to use the configuration file once again. We're going to put here the information that we want to change or add and restart the network service. So let's look at an example. I will open the interface file once again, and I'm going to change the IP address. Instead of the ending being cafe 10, we're going to have cafe 15. Again, I'm using the to open the file and modify yes and 15 is what I type here. I save the file and if we use the IP ADD command, I can see that nothing happened actually. The IP is still 10, so I need to restart the network Debian services to execute that change. So I'm going to use the system CTL command restart network to check that there are no errors, there are no errors here. So we're going to use IP ADD one. And now, yes, the IP address has been changed successfully. Now let's look at the configuration of the Ubuntu servers. But before that, let's check what are the interfaces that we have in our server. And using the command IP ADD, we can see that we have the virtual interface and also the NS3 interface connected to the internet. It is important to stress that it is important to look at which interfaces are present in the server and the name. This information, it is necessary to configure the IP address. In this case, our interface is ENMPS3, but we have an alternative name, which is NMP0S3. In many cases, we are going to see Debian a name or a different name. And if you use a different distribution, we might even use a different name for the interface. It's always good to know what name I'm using. Right now, we're going to use the alternative name that's been offered, which is ENP0S3. In order to use the Ubuntu configuration, we're going to use NetPlan which is the company responsible for this development uh, for Ubuntu. And we, this tool will allow us to facilitate network configurations. Now, first of all, we need to use Net uh, Beyond 3 that will show us what is the information that's being configured. Now we have the network option, version option, which is a different version that is being used and what are the interfaces dn h6 dhcp4 getting ready to work with cp4 so ipv6 is not enabled in this interface and if we are waiting for an hcp server to get the correct answer in order for these configurations to take place i'm going to need a configuration file those files are going to be found in the folder in the directory so we'll find that file when I use NetPlan, I can look at the content without parameter. And here we can see what we can find in the operating system saying that we have the same configurations used with the Nathion led command. So let's exclude the file. And I will use this option. I am going to use a different command that says beam etc in a plan config ENPOS3. So using this beam, we can use the text editor for better support. 
So in the configuration file for the interface, I will find different configuration options. To make it easier, I will use IPv6 and I will have a DNS server. And if you wish to know what the other options are, you can look them up in the uh, corresponding documentation. So let's start configuring. First, we need to use a network parameter, then version number two, which is the one that we are using, Ethernet, to configure Ethernet type interfaces. And we're going to use interface ENP0S3 as this For this type of file, the spaces that we're using for each option are important. As you can see, below network, we have a space right at the left corner. So that means that when we want to use this type of configuration, we well, might get an error message. So I will also type addresses. below ENP0S3, and below that interface, I'm going to have an IP address. That's why I am typing addresses in plural. What's the IP address that I'm going to use is 2001-12-FF0B113 CAFE 20-64. Now, we are going to indicate our gateway, and to do so, we use route and then two. So where is heading default? And well, that'll be my gateway. And via, I'm going to have the IP address 2001-12-FF-0B1131. Now, I will now key in the, the DNS server to be used. So name servers, addresses, the different addresses. And I will uh, look at what addresses I'm going to use. And for this one, I'm going to use Cloudflare, but you could also use your own DNS servers for your network or other DNS servers that are public. Another one is 26064700470041 for once at the end. Once we have configured this, we need to save the file using the W uh, W option, WU option. When we're working with Debian, these configurations that we'll find in this file have not yet been done in the operating system. We need to request the operating system to do so. Now, here we have the option to apply changes with a, and we flag it. And if we we might have the wrong configuration that we push to the operating system. So now I have dear try different tries. So we'll try to do the configuration. There might be an error. So we can see how to go about the configuration without impacting the process and we want corrected and the option to do so and to use in this uh, tutorial is netplan try. We run it. We have no errors displayed. So we click on enter and that will allow us or not to come back to the previous configuration. In this case, we're going to accept the configuration without any problem. It's been accepted. Using the IP ADD option, we will check whether our interface is applied successfully, and we're going to see the IPv6 address that we configure. It is up and running and working properly. Once we configure the IP address, we're going to do a connectivity test, a ping with Nick PR, Nick PR. And here we can see the different packages sent and the list of names, the list of DNS names. I am also going to test google.com and you can see that we have the different packages and the DNS resolution name as well as working. We can also use the command resolve CTL status 
to check whether the DNS configurations that were used are correct. And so we will check the server for Cloudflare. Cloudflare is using the server. We might also use a different tool that will specify a certain domain presenting information. And we can check what the server has sent to us and therefore check that the configuration that we've done with Cloudflare is correct. It's quite simple. You only need to open the configuration file, change the data, and that's all to modify what we did before. For example, we go from 20 to 25, and so it might say coffee 25 instead of cafe 20 at the end. So we're going to use the plan, the interface, the different addresses, and we're going to change, well, right here, instead of 20, I'll key in 25, and I have to check whether those configurations were applied. And look, it's not been applied we need to indicate or specify to the operating system that they need to uh, look for this information and apply it in the network interfaces. To do so, we're going to use the net plan try command. And remember that this is not automatically applied. Let's check if that is correct. And if it is, it will apply it into our network interface. So net plan try, there are no errors. So we can click on enter and it will accept the configurations. To check whether the configurations were applied, we're going to use the IP ADD and we will see that our IPv6 change from 20 to 25 so any other configuration that we need to do using this system, we uh, can do through the file and uh, we are going to use uh, the try parameter option or even apply it directly with the net IP apply command. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and do the next configuration. Tiago, well, that video was fascinating, but let's just stop it since we finished with the Ubuntu part and let's try to well, edit and add the video somewhere because it's very useful. It is a very good reference. It'll be useful for a lot of people when we are working with operating systems. Sometimes we might not remember exactly how the operating system works, whether it's Ubuntu, Debian, or many other Linux distributions that are out there. And of course, we don't have time to do it all because we only have 10 minutes left. But I just wanted, Tiago, if you wanted to say maybe some closing remarks because we have before we hand the floor over to to lucas yes of course i want to thank everyone at lacnic for inviting me it's been so important and it's very important that we can encourage more meetings like this to work with different ipv6 only services which is a reality that some that this will become more and more common in our day-to-day -day lives. And therefore, it is already a reality nowadays. And even in our training sessions, when we say that our provider and service providers will use only IPv6 blocks, and you might wonder, well, what do we do? We need to start working with IPv6 only networks. So I think this is a great initiative. I think it is great i hope you found it useful and that you can also use the upcoming seminars that we are organizing and the in-person tutorial that we are hosting in at blackneck i wanted to thank everyone's invitation everyone uh, at blackneck uh, sorry that the video was a little bit too long but there was a lot of information i wanted to share and i hope it helped you learn a little bit more Although, well, this might be new to some people, maybe some of you who are just getting started with the network services, IPv6 
do it's just uh here but i hope this has been useful to clarify some doubts you looked at debian you, you looked at ubuntu and well although there are similar operating systems i hope you appreciated how uh, they work and i hope you join us for the next webinars and we will be online we will be helping you for your next steps until well LACNIC in Fortaleza comes. Maybe we can answer one question that we have here. In the chat, there are some questions in the Q&A as well. So what's the difference in using a gateway with a local link? There's no difference because this is an IP that is always there. There's always a link local available and the IPs are going to be connected to that device. So there's no problem in configuring gateways using the local link, but we need to take some protective measures, it might be random, and therefore it might change. So we were going to do a static configuration using it, and that might generate some problems. If this is just an automated mechanism, this will not be a problem because it will be updated. But in general, when we have a static, static gateway, we might uh, be able to use a configure or pre-configure address without having to change it. Let me ask a question. We only have a few minutes left. If we could maybe recap, or if you can go over some of the most common mistakes in an IPv6 only network, what would you say? One of the main problems have to do with some mechanisms for those IPv6 only mechanisms. And I think that the biggest change for THCP and not being able to configure the gateway via router advertising, which is quite common, especially associated to fragmentation and IPv6 fragmentation is different. As we only have fragmentation at source, this is also a challenge for those of us who are might not be work, used to work with an IPv4 CMPP packages. But with regards to addressing, we need to consider that the trend, I mean, as people are used to working with IPv4, and when segmenting networks, we end up memorizing the subnetworks by heart, and we don't even make any further calculations. And we say, well, this is very hard. But actually, it is the exact same process. You're going to make the same calculations as we did with IPv4. It's just that we are so used to working with IPv4, we do it automatically in our heads. You divide 0, 128, and once I get to IPv6, I just wonder what's the half of this or this or that. It's just I'm not used to doing it. But once people understand or get used to how it works, we will see that people are going to understand this even further, and it will start making more sense. And we're going to start the configuration for IPv6, and it will be more simple. It will be easier. For configuration, we can plan even better, and it is a more rational logic. We, each letter that we use can be uh, used for a specific configuration. So when people start understanding that, it'll be much easier and it'll make much more sense actually to work with IPv6. 
Another thing that might not be a difficulty when it comes to configuration, but also change the mentality as to IPv4, that there are a few left and that we need to save. So am I going to give a slash 56 network to my client? That might be too much. I cannot divide it up and give them smaller spaces. So I think that this is a psychological uh, hurdle. It's not really a technical obstacle. I think there's no problem with that much control. There's a large number. So it's no longer necessary to really be able to focus on controlling about how many addresses I'm giving out. And it is also important to remember that IPv6 needs these types of addresses. And this is what, well, sometimes we need to consider with the firewall and to work because we need the multicast addresses to send the packages. And that is the normal uh, operation of IPv6. So in terms of configuration, that could also be something that might cause problems. And that's something that we have noticed with our students. Well, your answer has been great. Okay, so there are no further questions, but I will ask you very quickly to give me each of you two pieces of advice. So we've convinced them. They want to set up an IPv6 network. Tiago, what would you tell these people? Two recommendations or two pieces of advice to someone that will uh, deploy an IPv6 only network. Well, my first recommendation is not to miss out on the next activities that we are organizing the online webinar on the 13th and the practical hands-on tutorial at LACNIC. And also at NICBR, we do provide online training for IPv6 and courses that you can take whenever you want. We have tutorials, we have different materials uh, available for your charge for all of you who are interested in, in looking at them. And we always try to make all of these materials available for people who might not otherwise have access to in-person training. And so they might have uh, access to these uh, basic data, basic knowledge. Well, probably I'll repeat myself, but what I would say is to study, really thoroughly, thoroughly study IPv6. Don't be afraid to adopt the new technology, although it's really not that new. And as Tiago said, we have a lot of material available. There are courses available, open courses. We can take in-person courses in Brazil or in Sao Paulo. We have the IPv6 RPR site. And I mean, we have more than enough materials available. LACNIC itself has uh, materials available. We're recording some past sessions. There's a lot on IPv6. So my main recommendation is to keep studying to implement IPv6, and you'll see that's really not rocket science. It'll make your life easier, and it will really allow us to enhance the internet quite significantly. Great, great answers. I hope that people listening are taking notes. I loved, Tiago, what you said that, well, that people should engage and participate in our new webinar, September 13th. We're going to work about IP, IPv6 only proxy servers and some differences with NAT64. And don't forget, we also have a live event. It will be webcasted and we'll be in Fortaleza. And we are really going to speak about all of these more in depth. On our Zoom chat, you'll find the links to follow us and to join the upcoming events. And just to wrap up, Tiago, Lucas, thank you so much for your time. We know that that you've devoted some of your uh, minutes, uh, the minutes in your day to to share this with us. And, and Sandra, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Hello, well, Alejandro. Let's uh, wrap up the seminar. Thank you to all of the attendees. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, Lucas. And as Alejandro said before, um, 
we want to encourage you to participate on our next webinar, September 13th, same time. And if you have not registered yet for LACNAC 2023, LACNIC 40, you can please register online. We'll see you on September 13th. Have a great day.